Okay, thank you. Um, I'm actually a postdoc in uh, Professor Scott Burnett's lab. Uh, he currently is in Singapore on a guest professorship, so he couldn't make it, but uh, I'm happy to fill in for him. So I'll be talking about SOFC research that takes place at Northwestern, kind of showing you the highlights of different projects that we're doing here. So naturally, this is a culmination of a bunch of people's work, so I just want to acknowledge them first. Um, from the Barnett group, uh, we have Dr. Jason Nicholas, Meghna Shaw, David Beershank, and Scott Cronin. And then other NU faculty who work on these projects in the material science department, we have professors Voorhees, Mason, and Marks. And then in chemistry, Professor Poppelmeyer, and in physics, Professor Ellis. So I just want to go over uh, a quick background on the electrochemistry of a solid oxide fuel cell. So this is the uh, basic construction. Uh, you basically have three layers, a uh, solid dense electrolyte sandwiched between your two electrodes. This is just a micrograph of what that looks like. Um, generally, uh, this is a thin film electrolyte. So you see it's solid and dense, and this is about 10 microns across. And generally, you have about 10 microns of active, active electrode next to this interface. So the cathode is the air electrode uh, where oxygen diffuses towards the electrolyte where it's catalytically reduced to oxygen anion. Now the electrolyte is chosen to be an oxygen anion uh, conductor while it's electrically insulating. And because of the concentration gradient between the oxygen on the air electrode and the lack of oxygen on the uh, fuel electrode, you get uh, diffusion of these oxygen anions across this electrolyte interface. So as I mentioned, this is the fuel electrode. In this case, I'm just going to use hydrogen. Um, the hydrogen in this half reaction uh, uh, reacts with the oxygen anions to produce water and free electrons. The water escapes as steam, and the free electrons are collected in an external circuit, where if you apply a load, you get voltage and current out. So the overall reaction is just hydrogen plus oxygen that gives you water, but splitting this into two electrochemical reactions is what produces uh, this voltage. So uh, as we know, this is an electrochemical energy conversion device, but what we care about it is that it has very high efficiency and low, uh, zero to low emissions depending on the fuels that you use. Um, the key features of solid oxide fuel cells compared to uh, proton exchange fuel cells is that this is an oxygen ion conducting electrolyte. Uh, it has a fully solid state structure, which allows for simple designs. Uh, it has a high operating temperature, anywhere from 600 to 1,000 degrees Celsius. Um, and what's uh, kind of unique to SOFCs is that they're fuel flexible. Um, you can directly use higher hydrocarbons, which reduces the cost in general. Um, and then key energy applications for SOFCs involve transportation auxiliary power units, stationary power plants, and portable power generators. Um, however, there are other applications uh, and listed here is uh, using SOFCs as chemical reactors for partial oxidation and syngas production and also as electrolytic reactors for energy storage. So the areas of research interest that we really focus on here at Northwestern and have uh, projects uh, in these areas, um, I'll just kind of go through these and then show highlights of each of them. Uh, the first is energy storage, running a solid oxide fuel cell as an electrolysis cell. Um, alternative fuel operation, this is non-hydrogen. Um, for catalysis, we do partial oxidation. And then industrial transportation, we can run fuel cells on iso-octane and higher hydrocarbons. Uh, we do nanoparticle processing. This uh, reduces the overall operation temperature of the fuel cells, which reduces the cost. Uh, we work on modeling of the electrodes. Uh, we also look at the structure of the electrodes in three dimensions and try and relate this to the processing and the eventual performance of these electrodes. And we're also looking at anode degradation and I highlight both of these in red because these are both uh, projects where we do a collaboration with uh, people at the Electron Microscopy Center at Argonne. So this is just an example of uh, using a solid oxide fuel cell uh, as an electrochemical cell, uh, an SOEC. Uh, and this is basically the same diagram I just showed you, kind of tipped on its side. Here's your electrolyte, cathode, and anode. But what we do here is we actually, we're applying a, a reverse bias. So we're forcing the oxygen towards the air electrode against its concentration gradient. And basically, I've shown here with carbon dioxide and water, you can do either one or both in combination. Uh, it acts to uh, split the oxygen off of these to produce hydrogen and carbon monoxide, uh, which is also known as syngas, which is a, uh, a precursor for a catalytic conversion to liquid fuels. And just showing uh, an example of some of this work here, uh, this is the current density on the x-axis. As you increase the current density, uh, the content of uh, water and CO2 decreases, 
and your hydrogen and carbon monoxide increases. This is an example of the SOFC as a catalytic reactor. Um, similar idea, um, you're starting with a non-hydrogen fuel, in this case methane, uh, and what you're doing is uh, partially oxidizing the methane to produce hydrogen and carbon monoxide again, uh, producing syngas, and again shown here, this is the methane flow rate in the cell, uh, and red here plotted on the left side is your syngas output. So as you increase the methane flow rate, you increase your output of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And then also shown here, plotted on the right, is the power density of your uh, fuel cell. So you're increasing uh, the electrical output of the cell as well as producing uh, useful um, fuel from the methane. Um, and this is uh, very competitive with uh, normal SOFCs and ceramic membrane reactors. So this is an example of uh, an SOFC running on isooctane. Um, this is done uh, mainly through the addition of a catalyst layer, so this layer is placed on top of the anode. Um, the reason for this is that uh, commonly nickel, nickel YSC anodes uh, experience coking. This is where the carbon deposits onto the, uh, the nickel, and this is uh, detrimental for the performance of these anodes. You can see here, this is uh, three examples of a, a common nickel YSC anode um, degrading rapidly over time while running on isooctane. But if we add this catalyst layer, in this case a ruthenium ceria composite, uh, shown here, you get very stable operation. And you get uh, very high uh, conversion efficiency, and the excess heat from this reaction is used for this uh, reforming reaction. So this is an example of internal reforming, where you reduce the cost of not needing an external reformer to reform this isooctane down into, um, into hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So this is the first of two examples of the nanoparticle processing that we're doing. Uh, this is a, a, a novel technique developed here at Northwestern. Um, typically, ceramic anodes have a fairly poor performance. However, what we're using here is a, a lanthanum chromite uh, doped with strontium and ruthenium ceramic anode. And what we've seen uh, plotted here, this is current density and the power density of the cell, which is these arcs shown here is that over time, as we increase uh, the length of time that these cells are operated from 15 minutes up to 96 hours, you get a dramatic increase in the performance of the cell, which is quite opposite to what you usually see. And the reason for this is that this ruthenium precipitates out of this bulk ceramic, and shown here are just some TEM images of these ruthenium particles that are around five nanometers across, precipitating out to the surface. And as they precipitate out, the performance increases because these are the electrocatalyst particles for the reaction. Another method for nanoparticle uh, formation is uh, through infiltration. Uh, in this technique, uh, we basically have a scaffold of our oxygen ion conductor, uh, and we infiltrate uh, nitrate solutions of the elements involved in the electrocatalyst particle, and we react them at 800 degrees C, and uh, these form these uh, nano-sized particles. They're a little larger than the ones we showed before, maybe on the order of 50 nanometers, uh, but these form uh, inside the electrode. And of course, the advantage of having these uh, nanoscale electric uh, catalyst particles is you have increased surface area and hence catalytic activity. Um, and so you can get better performance at lower temperatures, and also at lower temperatures it reduces the propensity for uh, these types of particles to coarsen. So this is the, uh, the first example of work that we're doing in collaboration with uh, Argon at the EMC. Um, this is to study the three-dimensional structure of SOFC electrodes. And what we use is a dual beam focused ion beam scanning electron microscope, uh, in short, FIB-SEM. Um, this has uh, two beams in situ, so you have an ion beam and an electron beam. And what we do is we polish our electrode and then cut out this uh, trench uh, using the ion beam. And this reveals this uh, surface of material here that we can then image with the electron beam at the same time. And what we can do is continually polish away or take consecutive slices of material um, off of this face and take an image each time, and you get a series of images that you can stack back together uh, using software to get a continuous three-dimensional set of data. Um, currently, we use three different instruments. They're all FIB-SEMs, um, but depending on the materials that we're trying to look at, you need a good material contrast in order to um, determine what materials are what. Generally, these are composite electrodes. Um, we have an FEI instrument at Northwestern. Uh, there's the Zeiss instrument at the EMC. Um, and we've been collaborating with John Hiller and Dean Miller there. Um, and we've also used a Zeiss uh, with an energy selective backscatter detector at UC Irvine, 
although Argon has just purchased this instrument, um, so we hope to do uh, work with them in the future. So this is just an example of what you get out of this kind of work. Uh, this is a three-dimensional reconstruction of an LSMYC cathode. Um, this is a composite cathode. Um, and I'm just uh, highlighting what we can get, but what we really care about is what we can calculate from the structure. We're really trying to calculate three-dimensional characteristics that relate to the electrochemical performance of these cells. So specifically, uh, the connectivity of the phases. If you have isolated particles, they're inactive in the electrochemical reaction. Um, the tortuosity of those phases, that's just uh, a word for how, how windy a path is, I guess. It, it uh, is manifested in uh, diffusion limitations within each of the phases. And then also the triple phase boundary density, which uh, if you work with uh, fuel cells, you know is important. But this is basically, it's a line density where the three phases intersect. And this is generally understood, depending on the materials used, where the electrochemical reaction takes place. So understanding how much of this you have is important for understanding how the fuel cell operates. So we're also doing some modeling. Um, the goal of this is to do some uh, long-term evolution of the electrode microstructure. Uh, and what we'd like to do is predict the microstructure and performance evolution over very long periods of time based on much shorter experiments. So we're using accelerated SOFC testing combined with this quantitative 3D microstructural measurements that I just showed. And the goal is to develop accurate models of coarsening kinetics as well as uh, detailed structural electrochemical models so that once we have a certain structure, we can predict what the resistance of that electrode would be. So I'm just going to show an example here of uh, nickel coarsening and nickel YSZ. This is a project we're working on. Um, this is also in collaboration with a group at University of Michigan who does this phase field modeling for us. And I'll just run this in the background. This is just a short movie uh, that keeps repeating, so you can see when it starts again, that shows uh, the coarsening of the nickel, which is in green, the blue is the porosity, and the, uh, the ionic material is transparent. And basically what, what we can do is we take our uh, three-dimensional structure that we get uh, experimentally and use that as a starting point for this modeling to be able to predict the coarsening of the nickel over long periods of time and the degradation that occurs in the electrode. And we can also compare this to experiments where we've also tested cells for periods of time and measured the coarsening through these uh, uh, structural measurements. So in conclusions, uh, naturally SOCs are thought of as electrochemical energy conversion devices, but they also are pertinent to a number of fields in energy, uh, energy storage, catalysis, and transportation. Uh, we currently have work ongoing with Argon at the EMC to study these uh, 3D structures of electrodes. Um, and I just wanted to show a very recent direction of this work uh, using this 3D uh, structure technique. Uh, this doesn't relate to SOCs, but uh, we recently uh, reconstructed a lithium-ion battery electrode structure um, and hope to do future work with this as well. <laughs>